Good afternoon. You are tuned in to BNH's virtual event space. Today, we are talking about Sony's wonderful F4 lenses, a landscape photographer's ideal choice. Thank you, Sony, for hosting. And thank you, Sony artisan of imagery, Mahesh Thapa, for joining us. Mahesh, what's going on, man? Well, it's great to be back. It's summer in Seattle. I've been out photographing, camping, backpacking, you know, getting content for these F4 <laughs> lens presentations. <laughs> no rain? I didn't hear you mention no. rain. <laughs> summer's a best kept secret in the country. I think I just gave it away. But, uh, you know, Seattle summers are, I, I keep telling my wife, she's like, hey, let's go somewhere for a vacation in summer. I go, why would I want to leave Seattle in the summertime? This is the best time you want to be in Seattle. People come from all over the world to be in Seattle in the summertime. You know, maybe the winter time, maybe the spring will go away, but Seattle is where you want to be when there's summer. <laughs> well, now I know. I'm going to have to add it to my summer list. I never would have thought. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're look, we have to deal with it here in New York. You guys could deal with it there for a little bit, right? Right. Well, well, Mahesh, it's great to have you on. We always love having your expertise. And uh look, you're just one of our one of our favorites. I'm gonna go out there and say we don't play favorites over here, but we love having Mahesh on. He always brings great vibes and uh, a ton of great information. So I'm gonna kick it over to you. I will remind everybody that we will be taking your questions. So if you do have them, get them into the comment section. But uh Mahesh, I'm gonna go bye bye. I'll see you in a bit for some QA. All right. Thank you, brother. Gang, it's wonderful to be here again. It's been a few months, but uh, I think I have four of these coming up. So I hope you'll join me in the other sessions too. And and hopefully they're all going to be engaging, informative, uh, educational. I love doing these things and hopefully that projects uh, uh, through the web here. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, my favorite equipment, uh, and those are F4 lenses. So just a Quick disclosure uh, before before we get started. Uh, this is a Sony sponsored event. I am a Sony Alpha ambassador, uh, so all the gear I use and the gear I talk about uh, is going to be Sony based. But I really feel that uh, it's going to be brand agnostic as far as the concepts go, as far as the uh, what you can achieve with these types of equipments. So, with that being said, uh, let's get started. I was sort of going back to the point where I said, well, where, when did I really start using F4 lenses? You know, I think of photography or photographers as evolving from the, from the beginning aspects of photography to where they get a little better, a little better. I remember first thinking, you know, the very first image that I liked was basically it was in focus. Uh, the composition was halfway decent. Uh, and nothing was blown out or too dark. And I said, well, if I can meet those criteria, th that's a great picture. You know, and then you sort of evolve a little and you start getting obsessed with lenses. They go, oh, I really need that lens with the F2.8 shallow depth of field or the F1.4. Uh, how sharp is it at the corners? Ah, you know, the, it's a little off center. This is a crap lens. I don't want this. Uh, and then you realize, you know, all that stuff doesn't matter. It's, a lot of it's about being in the moment, capturing hopefully capturing the mood, not necessarily doing documentary, but capturing the mood of how you're feeling, uh, the right composition, the right light. And sort of when you get to that level, you start to notice that, you know, you don't necessarily need the biggest, heaviest, best, quote unquote, best equipment to capture your vision, to create your vision. And that's when I said to myself, when did that really happen with me? And I went back into my files and I found this article that I wrote for Alpha Universe. Uh, the, the web, the link is right here, but this was published in 2015. So I think in, in even that, there's, a, there's an article that says, the case for F4 zoom lenses. And I really believe this. And I believe this for many, many years that, you know, as a landscape photographer who likes to travel, backpack, um, uh, camp, uh, hike, uh, this really is the ideal sort of set of equipment for a balance between quality, uh, room in the bag, uh, weight, uh, uh, be, being able to carry other accessories that are also manageable and not so expensive. Uh, and, and hopefully I can sort of make you believe this also. So if you have a chance, go ahead and check this information out. A lot of the concepts I talk about today are here and, and, they're, and they really haven't changed. And so we want to delve a little deeper into that. So why 
f4 lenses for landscapes and it's really really simple and you know if you think about it it's it's quite intuitive you know you don't need me to tell you these things but it helps with helps when we point these out specifically and then you could come up with examples yourself or think about situations where this was true first of all the equipment is much smaller right uh, f2.8 lenses f2 lenses versus f4 lenses that are much smaller uh, in fact i am going uh, to pause the share and hopefully you can kind of see this here is a 24 to 70 f 2.8 lens okay and i'm going to show you a lens that has greater range at 24 to 105 much lighter this is the 24 to 105 f4g and this is the 20 4 to 72.8, much smaller, much lighter, a lot easier to carry. And at the apertures that I use these lenses at, I would say equally as sharp, both lenses. I have no complaints. I use them on 60, 62, 40, 20 megapixel sensors, and I don't see an appreciable, appreciable dis, uh, difference, provided that you use the proper technique. So smaller, lighter less expensive, right? Much in, in some situations, F2 lenses can, 2.8 lenses can be twice as expensive as F4 lenses. Uh, there are also more options available to you for the uh, narrower aperture lenses in other manufacturers. If, you're, if you don't want to buy first party lenses, third party lenses also offer a more, a larger variety of F4 lenses than F2.8 lenses. And finally, smaller accessories, right? I sort of sh show you some filter system here, but just as a practical point of view, this is the filter bag I carry for my F2.8 lenses, which are often 82 millimeters in diameter for the filter thread. So, so this is you know my grad ND filters, my ND filters, my reverse grad ND polarizers, the unit that attaches the front element uh, uh, is also, I'm going to share again, resume share. Uh, it's also much bigger. And here is what I use. And here is what I use for the F4 lenses. I mean, literally twice as big a filter system. And there's nothing different about this filter set versus this filter set, okay? So just to give you an example, I'm going to show you just the element that goes in front of the lens on a 82 millimeter system. Here it is right here. Now I'm gonna show you how that is when you have 72 millimeter system or smaller even. Yeah, right? Look at the difference. And think about the filters that you put on here, square filters or rectangular filters that would go on here versus that would go on here. It's much bigger, much more different. And obviously this is going to be a much less expensive set of filters to carry around than something for uh, 82 millimeter or a 77 millimeter even uh, system. So smaller, lighter, less expensive. And that's true, not just for the lenses, but also for the accessories. The tripod you have to carry often can be lighter uh, and quote unquote less robust if you needed to be for the F4 equipment the uh you know uh, the cases and the backpacks they all can be much smaller so i really like that for the f4 system particularly when i'm doing a lot of backpacking and, and hiking so and let's talk about just the images that you typically carry or, or capture for landscape images when I do landscapes, I'm I'm sort of the classic landscape photographer where I have a foreground element, a mid-ground element, and a background element. Uh, something of interest on either side, you know, S-curves, rules of thirds, uh, balance. And when you want to achieve these types of images, it really helps to have a very wide depth of field, right? So, or very long depth of field where everything from the foreground to the background is in focus. So how do you achieve that? In landscape photography, well, you narrow the aperture down. You know, you shoot at f5.6, f8, f11, sometimes f16. But if you go anywhere beyond like f11, you start getting diffraction associated softness. So I sort of try to avoid that. 
So if I'm carrying a 2.8 lens and I stop it down to f8, f11 all the time, what's the point of me using it at f2.8 or carrying an f2.8 lens, which is just bigger, bigger, heavier, more expensive? So when I want more depth of field, I might as well just take the f4 lens. And here's something that most people, I think they know, but they don't realize the significance of it. The sweet spot of most lenses, now most of not every lens, but most lenses, the sweet spot is usually one to two stops narrower than the widest aperture. So if you have an F2.8 lens, usually the uh, two stops sort of narrower than 2.8 is gonna be uh, F5.6. Uh, three stops would be uh, F8. So you usually, if you wanna optimize your sharpness for that lens, you're gonna be shooting at that depth of field anyway, or aperture anyway, uh, and try to avoid some of those very wide apertures where it often gets softer in the corners, right? So when you have an F4 lens, you're shooting that two steps more is F8 where you want to be anywhere. That you're already at the sweet spot as opposed to the sweet spot of an F2.8 lens, it may be F5.6, but the F5.6 on a 2.8 lens may not give you as much depth of field as you'd like. Yes, you can go to uh, uh, F8, but you've sort of gone away from the sweet spot, if you will, of that lens. So oftentimes the sweet spot of a F4 lens is much close, closer to the aperture that I really am shooting at anyway. So something to keep in mind as you sort of make your decisions about which lenses are optimal for your type of photography. So the one question I always get asked when I talk about this is, well, what about astrophotography? Don't you want the widest aperture? Uh, you know, the, the brightest lens. And in many ways, that's very, very true, right? But that's not to say you can't create good astrophotography images with, with an F4 lens. For example, here's an uh, exposure I did several years ago, uh, A7R2 with the old Sony 1635 F4 lens. I actually took two exposures, one exposure for the foreground a little earlier in the evening because I wanted to get a little bit of shadow detail uh, uh, in the in the forest uh, and open up the shutter speed a little longer so I can capture this entire sort of trail of lights uh, in the foreground. And then when the light got dimmer and 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 it became when and the Milky Way came out, I took another exposure for 30 seconds at f4 and ISO 32. Well, it's perfectly fine uh, to get that Milky Way shot at, at, at F4, as long as you're, you have a, a dark enough area that you can do that in. Yes, would it have been a brighter sky, maybe slightly less noisy sky uh, at F1.8, uh, uh, F1 F1.4, F2? Yes, definitely. But it's, again, it's a question of making compromises, right? And working with the equipment that you have. And in many ways, and, and I think this is true, limiting yourself in certain ways increases your creativity because now you have to rely on what you have to create the effect that you want. For example, I could have taken multiple exposures at F4 and combined them to get rid of the noise because you can combine multiple high ISO images to reduce the noise. Uh, you know, so that's, that's also another possibility. So just because you have an F4 lens, don't think that, you know, shooting astro, shooting stars, night, is completely out of the realm of possibility. You need a tripod for these low light shots anyway, so might as well utilize that and just uh, <clears throat> come up with the best that you can. And oftentimes the best you can is actually quite good. So I was looking through the article I talked to you about and I, and I saw oh, what was I carrying in 2015? And I, and, I, and I reread that article that I wrote and this is what I was carrying. I was carrying a Sony 1635 F4 uh, a 24 to 70 f4 they 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 made that i think i think they've stopped making this lens now uh and the 70 to 200 f4 right there's there's sort of like my trifecta of f4 lenses and i'm looking at my bag now and what am i carrying now and not a whole lot different i still have the 1635 except it's the new pz version where i can control uh the the zooming uh directly from the lens barrel so there's no noise so let me like i have that lens right here uh, I don't know if you can see it, but this is the lens right here, the PZ version, uh, and it's actually lighter, smaller. You can, it has a de-click button right over here. So if you want to do video or if you want to do some st stepless aperture changes, uh, you won't hear that clicking. So it's in some ways a uh, uh, much more advanced 1635, and it uses 72 millimeter filter threads, which is great. Uh, it even has a, a customizable button here that I often 
uh, assign uh, to face detect uh, if I have somebody in the field of view. But this is great. I love I love the newer version of the F4 1635 that Sony came out with. Um, it's not that old either. And my workhorse lens, instead of the 24 to 70 F4, is now that 24 to 105 uh, F4. This lenser that's virtually almost always on my A7R5 body. Uh, if I could carry one lens for most situations, this one would be it. Actually, there's a caveat to that because uh, because I have this new lens I'll talk to you about in a few seconds, uh, in a few minutes that I may consider switching to. But for now, I'm still carrying this as my main workhorse lens, uh, which is the 24 to 105, and it's actually sharper, actually quite a bit sharper than the old 24 to 70 f4 that Sony used to make. Uh, modern glass, modern techniques, uh, they've really perfected that uh, on all their uh, G Master and G lenses. And finally, the newly announced 20, uh, excuse, newly announced 70 to 200 F4 macro is an amazing lens. Uh, I don't have it with me. It's on order uh, on with B and H. So Derek, if you could find that for me, <laughs> put me in the top of the list, send that to me, that would be awesome. I've already bugged Sony about it, but I need to get my hands on that 70 to 200 F4. I've played around with it. I've, I've shot with it and it's an amazing lens. Uh, I think much, it's it's lighter, smaller, more capable than the old 70 to 200 F4, which is already great, which I already love. So I, I'm not getting the new one because it's sharper, because you know I think the sharpness is about the same, but it's the weight factor, the fact that it can do macro now, one, one to one to point, 1 1.5, sorry, 0. 0.5 macro, but with the telephoto uh, and extension tubes, you can actually get one to one macro with that. So now I have a built-in macro in one of my lenses, which will sort of increase my uh, capacity to capture various types of images, so which is great. So this is, and but in essence, you know, the, the focal lengths haven't really changed. I still have the very wide aperture, sorry, wide uh, focal length being around 16 millimeters uh, and the uh, telephoto end being 200 millimeters. But then, I, you know, I used to think to myself, is 200 millimeters enough? Well, if you have one of the high resolution Sony bodies like the A7R4 or A7R5, uh, you've got 60 megapixels. Even if you crop that 60 megapixel image down to 30 megapixel, that's a 2x factor. Now you've just gone from a 200 millimeter lens to a 400 millimeter equivalent lens, which for landscape work and getting that sort of telephoto effect, uh, some people call it the compression effect, uh, but I don't think compression effect really uh, even exists. It's just the, the way the, the field of view is. But to get that compression effect, it's 7200 capable, even with a little bit of cropping, it looks great. 30 megapixels is nothing to, nothing to sneeze at. So you can still achieve, you know, much of your photographic goals with just three these three lenses. So, but I said, I am strongly considering changing my equipment up a little bit, particularly if I'm going on the more strenuous hikes. And for that, I have, and I'm trying this out and I'm actually been very, very happy with it. It's this lens right here, which is the 20 to 70 f4. It's sort of like a compromise between the 16 to 35 f4 and the 24 to 105 f4. I don't quite get the 16 millimeter focal length, but 20 is pretty good for an ultra wide angle lens. Uh, and more often than not, I am zooming in a little bit on the 16 to 35 to to get rid of some of the corner vignetting that can happen. So I'm typically at about 18 millimeters anyway. And at 20 millimeters, this uh, 20 to 70 is already very, very sharp and without any appreciable vignetting. So I'm not really losing that much information at the periphery. And 70 millimeters was good enough for me back in the day. You know, I don't necessarily need that 70 to 100 because that's now being fulfilled by the 70 to 200 macro. So if you don't want to carry three lenses, if you want to just get away with two lenses, I think this is a... A, a really something to consider a way to go in. I'm, I'm thinking of sort of experimenting with this once the 270 F4 macro comes in, uh, just carrying these two lenses. Now, like I said, you can do some astro stuff, you know, um, that's true. But if you really want to capture that, that beautiful Milky Way with the lowest noise possible, with the least amount of post-processing, uh, then consider adding uh, a 14, 20, or 24 uh, wide aperture lens like the 14 1.8 Sony makes that I'd love the 20 uh, 1.8 let me show you I have that right here it's a tiny lens 
this is a 21.8 G and this is about as sharp a lens that you're ever going to shoot. Uh, and it's great for asteroid. It's very low coma uh, at the periphery. So the stars look pinpoint even out to the periphery. Uh, of course, if you if your budget can withstand it and if you have room and, you're, and you don't mind a little bit heavier lens for Astro, the 2414 uh, is also good. It's a little uh, narrower field of view. Uh, you can use that. And there is also, I think I have the other one right here. And this is also the, what did I do with the other lens? Well, I also have the uh, 14 1.4. Oh yeah, here it is right here. So this is the 14 1.4. Uh, I like this for Astro for certain cases. 14 is a little bit too wide for me. I like the 20 to 24 range most. Well. So typically if I know I'm going to be doing hardcore Astro work, I will add uh, the 21.8 to the, or the 24 1.4 in my bag. It's still a very, very light kit. But again, the major workhorse of this system for most situations for me uh, is going to be that F4, 24 to 70, 70 to 200. And uh, I'll uh, hopefully maybe I can put an update somewhere uh, when I do this and if I'd like this better than my three lens system. Okay. Now, if I want to go ultra, ultra light, right? If I look, if a couple of years ago, I took a bunch of my images for several years uh, in Lightroom and I just sort of organized it based on what focal lengths I was shooting at. And most of my focal lengths were either uh, in the ultra wide range, in the 18, 20 millimeter range, uh, or in the standard range, about 70 millimeters or so. So if I wanted to go ultra light, I could just take that Sony A7R5 body and just a single 20 to 70 millimeter F4 lens. That would be great. Again, if I wanted an Astro, the ultra light 20 millimeters, 1.8 G, uh, I could throw in the bag. But even if I didn't want to do that, just a single lens combo with a high resolution sensor, uh, would be this right here, the Sovian A7R5 and the 20 to 70 F4G. So that that's that's why I'm going for multiple days and I have like no room in the bag except for one camera and one lens. This is what I, what I would ideally take. Now this is full frame. Now, the great thing is if you want to go even lighter, there's still great quality APS-C system out there. So I used to have this ultra wide angle lens here, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I have so many, so many lenses out here. To, oh, so th I used to have the 10 to 18 f4 for the APS-C, the Sony uh, for the Sony APS-C system. Great lens. One thing that bothered me about this lens was it wasn't weather sealed, right? I loved everything except weather sealing. And living in the Pacific Northwest, it's it's really with inclement weather, particularly if you go in non-summer months and you, there's, you don't know when the weather the weather is going to change. So I really, really wanted a weather sealed version. And lo and behold, Sony came up with one. This is the 10 to 20 G F4 lens. So this has replaced my ultra wide uh, F4 lens for APC system. I'm still rocking the A6600 right now and B&H, I have got the A6700 on order. Make that happen for me too, buddy. <laughs> so that's hopefully, I'm, I'm switching over the A6700, but that's that's what I typically carry for the ultra wide. For the standard zoom, um, I had I had the 18 to 105 F4. It was light. It was actually quite light for the size, but it was kind of bulky. So I have sort of gotten rid of that and I'm just using a standard prime lens, you know, for that focal length. So I'm using like a, uh, a 55 millimeter 1.8, which is a full frame uh, for full frame camera lens, but it's perfect for that intermediate distance. Uh, and what I've done is add this 70 to 350. I know it's not an F4 lens, but it is so compact and it's weather sealed and it's so amazing. I can't believe how sharp this is. And this is this is all of this is the 70 to 350. You know, it's it's like a 500 millimeter lens. Basically, you have um, and even though it's not an F4, for the type of shooting I'm doing, I'm willing to sacrifice that. I haven't found a great solution to the F4 paradigm here on the APS-C for the telephoto, but in the meantime, this is good. I may just take the 7200 F4 if that, but again, that's going to be bigger than even this. So I'm, this is the one exception to my uh, F4 rule is this 70 to 350 millimeter F4, 5 to 6.3. It's just so small, so light, so well-built, weather-sealed. 
That's what I take from an APS-C telephoto needs. Now, again, F4 an APS-C sensor, it's a little bit more compromising for astro work. And I think here you're, it's, it's hard to get great astro work. There's a lot of post-processing involved, a lot of multiple shots, combining multiple shots. So if you don't want to deal with that quote unquote hassle, then it just carry one of these little guys. I mean, these are so light and so inexpensive. Well, not inexpensive, I guess, but so light, like 11 millimeter F18, so good for astro. Or the, what is this one? The 15, yeah, 15 millimeter F14 for astro. These are both amazing, tiny, tiny nelsas, very, very lightweight. So if you really are hankering to Astro and you and you don't want to shoot an F4 because it's an APS-C sensor, then one of those two lenses is going to be perfect, depending on what your tastes are for the field of view uh, uh, of the stars. So that's what I sort of recommend uh, for the APS-C system and F4 lenses. So... I just want to go over a couple of other things. Uh, the presentation itself is going to stop right there. But, you know, there's the, and there are multiple bodies that you can use with the F4 system. And I, I talked about how I use the Sony A7R5 right now uh, and the 24 to 70 F4 if I'm going ultra light. But another option is to get a full frame A7C. That's about the same size as the APS-C A6700. Look at that. It's about the same size, yet you can really, hopefully you can, it's a little blurry, sorry. Hopefully you can appreciate that this is about the same size, but you have a full four 24 megapixel sensor with the ultra lightweight F4 lens that also has a great combination. You don't need the A7R or R5 uh, or, or, or a bigger body if you really want to go ultra lightweight. Sometimes you have a little bit more room in your, in your backpack and you're willing to carry a little heavier gear, in which case I think if you don't want the 7200 F4 uh, and you need a little bit more native reach without having to go to teleconverters, I really think the 100 to 400 is actually a great, great option. So this is the 100 or 400 uh, mounted on an A7 IV body, uh, which I find to be actually very good. And it's actually not that heavy. Uh, it's a little large, so it takes some more room. But if you're willing to sacrifice that, then that is a good option for you. Uh, but this talk is about F4 lenses, but what I've talked about, I think, is, is ideal for landscape photography. And if you need that shallow depth of field, if you need that extra bit of light, just carry a single focal length prime that it'll, and, and that'll, that'll fulfill your needs. In fact, you can carry a prime that's 1418 F2. That gives you much more light and narrower uh, and a shallow depth of field than an F2.8 uh, F lens will be. Now, I don't want to seem like I don't like F2.8 F2 lenses. I do. I think they have their place. But for my type of photography, most of the time I'm using F4. So so that sort of concludes the presentation part of it. I know you guys must have some questions, so fire away, guys. There we go. We're going to open it back up for questions. If you guys have them, get them in. Mahesh, I'm going to get it started with the questions. Yeah. Besides the obvious low light, I think, you know, event photographers come to mind, like wedding photographers and event photographers who will obviously want to go for like a 2.8 version or, or a faster version. Is there any other reason, um, practical reason, that people should consider um, going with a faster version than, than an F4? Is it something where, like you said, you can get an F4 across the board, save some money, save your back and your shoulders, and then have like that one fast prime that you go to? Right. So that's, that's a great question. And I'm going to use an example from the birding world. I do a lot of birding photography also. So in those situations, I actually have a 600 F4, right? Uh, and then, but I'm also shooting that at F8, usually, and when the well, light is good, because I want both eyes in focus, the beak and the eyes in focus, because that's such a big focal length that at, uh, at F4, it, 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 there's a lot of softness in parts of the face that I don't like. So I typically shoot that at F8. So the question becomes, well, why are you shooting a 600 F4 at F8? Why not just buy a 200 to 600 millimeter 
uh, you know, f4.5 to 6.3 lens that Sony makes, much lighter, much cheaper, easier to carry. Why not just do that? So here's something that people, I think a lot of people, even birders, don't realize why the f4 is so important or the f2.8 is so important. It's because when the light gets low and you autofocus, okay, so this is what the camera and the lens are doing. Even if I have my aperture at f8, when I hit that half shutter button, when I hit that focus button, it opens up the aperture to the widest you can, f2.8, to establish that focus. So when it does that, the wider it can open that aperture, the quicker it's going to achieve that autofocus. So that's why I use a f4 600 millimeter lens because I'm shooting at low light, even though I shoot at f8 because it's going to open up to f4 to, to, to focus on the bird or the object and then narrow the aperture to actually take the shot. So same concept can be applied to an f2.8 lens, right? If you're in a situation where you need that extra bit of uh, EV equivalence in low light, right? If you know, if you sometimes, a lot of times the parameters of lenses will come out like, oh, you know what? This can focus up to negative five EV. Uh, that means, so you could still shoot that at f8, but when you, when you, when you put it at f8, f11, it still opens up the aperture to f2.8, gets autofocus, and then captures the image. So that's why I think event photographers and wedding photographers really like that f2.8 ability and not even realize that that's why they like it is because the autofocus is better in those low light situations because of that ability. So eloquently stated. I think you're right on that. I think a lot of times, even, even event photographers, when you think about it, they're not shooting f2.8 all. Right. You're generally, you're shooting a lot of groups of people. You're usually at at least f4 just for depth purposes, just to get a right. little bit more depth in your images. So that's a great point, Mahesh. Um, we had a more situational question coming in from Eve asking for shooting glaciers. Should Eve use the 24 to 105 or the 20 millimeter G shooting on an A7C? Right. So are you going to be on the glacier shooting or are you going to be from a helicopter shooting? That actually makes a difference. That's a, that's a big difference right there. Or one yeah, or like a, a, you know, one of the, the Alaskan cruises where you're shooting yeah. from a cruise ship. I think, I mean, yeah, 20 millimeters is the A7C yeah. is that's a full frame body. correct? That's a full frame body. So, you know, for something like glaciers, I think I'm always a big fan of the, of the zoom lens for, for trips like that, because it gives me more compositional freedom. And typically when you're uh, when you're in that area, you, you have good light. Uh, and remember that, uh, you know, when you're shooting in snow, white conditions, uh, don't trust the metering system of your camera. Oftentimes, it tries to make everything gray. So when you're shooting in a glacier, just just a just a little practical tip for you, no matter what lens you're using, you awfully have to overexpose the image, maybe one and a half, two stops to get that really white of the white come out, as opposed to the white coming out as a as a grayish, uh, grayish looking image. But as far as the lens choice, uh, if you're inside of a helicopter, you don't want to use the 20 millimeters because you're going to have to reach that camera out way outside the helicopter just so you don't get parts of the helicopter in your picture. And it's going to look a little funny. Uh, the zoom up there really helps. But if you're down by the glacier and you want that really beautiful wide angle view, getting a foreground and you know, 20 millimeters. But even with that being said, I love the versatility of the zoom, the 24 to 105 f4. I feel like there's this stigma that's out there that's been created and it's almost impossible to erase at this point of F4 being less professional or less usable in professional circumstances. I feel like we're we're fighting ourselves tooth and nail constantly to show that, look, you don't have to have an F1.4 lens. You don't have to have an F2.8, an F2, anything that fast to be considered a professional use lens. No, I, Derek, I fair think, I think say? oh, I think it's very fair. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I, not blame, but and I, I sort of, uh, I think that's the influence of people being obsessed with bokeh uh, in mm -hmm. all situations, you know, and what I tell people, and it's, it, it's just, it's just a mindset. And it's just knowing the concept as opposed to just believing every influencer out there who says F2A, shell it up, they feel is the best, you know. There's actually a formula that you can use, a very easy formula that you, you don't even have to know that that says that yes, the depth of field is dependent on the aperture, right? It's a it's sort of a linear relationship with aperture, 
but it's an exponential relationship with focal length, right? So, uh, and it's also an exponential relationship with the distance to the subject matter. I say, if you really want that shallow depth of field, you're going to get a more a shallow depth of field shooting at you know 200 millimeters at f8 than you are going to shoot it in 50 millimeters at f2.8 or f2 because the influence of 200 millimeters is to the power of two greater than the influence in the aperture. So if you want that shallow depth of field, use a use a longer focal length. Use an 85 millimeter instead of 35. You know, use a 135 instead of 50 millimeters. So that's what you do to get a shallower depth of field if that's what you're looking for. But so much more important, I think, is the composition and the light. And there's people are just obsessed with the shallow depth of field, but that's not the end all be all. Totally. And and I can't tell you how many times I'm out with people and they don't understand the the physics of lenses in that if you're shooting at 20 millimeters. Right. Everything's inherently, even if you have an F2.8, yep. you're going to be, it's going to be more in, inherently more in focus. Yeah. Just based on the, the physics of, of the lens. Of the focal length. Of the focal, the focal length. length has a much bigger influence on depth of field than the aperture does. Yeah. Right. For example, the 600 millimeters, I could shoot that at F32, right? And it's still going to look like <laughs> just the head is in focus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I think I wish I I think I wish I knew more people understood that dynamic because it would drive home this. I feel like for a long time getting the F4 lens is has been like the like the insider secret of Yo, like yeah. well, I don't, you know, F2.8 there's there's such as like I don't have to. Well, you know, I sort of, yeah. I, in the beginning I sort of talked about this uh evolution, my evolution as a photographer, you know, where I was obsessed with <clears throat> getting a sharp image and obsessed with the equipment and you know, obsessed with like, oh, I got to make sure that this object is in the lower right third so the composition is right. And then you realize at the end it's just, you know, it's about the light, it's about the feeling, the mood you're trying to convey. It doesn't have to be the sharpest image. It doesn't have to be the best exposed image. You know, it's 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 a and and then and then you, and then you realize you know, you're really you're really shooting for yourself. You're really shooting for something to make you happy. I mean, for, for, I, mean I don't. I mean, I'm you know a master for Sony, but I don't make a living from this, so I don't I don't have to make anybody else happy but myself. <laughs> so I have yeah. that luxury uh, of saying that. But that's that's what you realize that all of that stuff doesn't matter and. And if I can save my back, save my wallet with an F4 lens, I'm going to do it. <laughs> totally, totally. We had a couple of questions from Vincent joining us here on Zoom. Uh, yeah. First question, asking if you've ever used a flash with any of your F4 lenses. What is your experience with that? For, I have, I have used flash, but I almost never use on-camera flash. So um, we often go out and do... Uh, environmental portraits. Uh, we'll have maybe a model go out uh, or one of my friends go out, uh, in which case I carry a very small handheld strobe off camera, off camera light, with a little diffuser on it. Uh, very lightweight. Uh, I think a, a Pro Photo makes a very good one. Godox makes very good ones. It doesn't have to be expensive uh, and it's lightweight. So, I, yes, I have used it with F4 lenses. Um, and remember <clears throat> with strobes, uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the exposure of your environment right. So let's say you have a backlit scene, you're making sure that the scene is properly exposed, and then you're using the strobe to properly light your subject. Um, and which means that oftentimes you're, you're playing around with the ISO values to uh, ISO. You think of ISO as affecting the, the exposure of the environment. Uh, and sort of the uh, the flash and the aperture ex uh, having a bigger influence on the exposure of your of your subject matter. So it's really um, that's what you're really playing around with, whether you realize it or not. And if you find that your 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 environment is too dark or too bright, uh, play around with your ISO values. That'll actually get you much closer. Uh, so really, the f four nature of the lens uh, doesn't matter. Perfect. And a uh, follow-up question from Vincent asking, what was the filter set you recommended for the F4 lens? Uh, you know, so I've been using Nisi filters for several years. There are many great companies out there. I think a lot of, lot of, lot of great companies, but my filter of, but, you know, full disclosure, Nisi does, does, uh, I am an ambassador for Nisi. Uh, I do use the filters, but I, I would use them regardless. And going back to Eve's question, Eve did uh, add a, a response on that. Will be on a ship and standing on. So 
We got a double shot far and on. Yep. 24 to 70. You're 24 to 105 because it has image stabilization that'll work very well with your Sony body uh, together. Is that something you recommend in general, Mahesh, is looking more at the features available or features not available, such as weatherproofing? I know sometimes when you move up into like the professional grade of lenses, you're getting weatherproofing that might not be on an F4 version. So is is that something that you personally would look closer at? I mean, I feel like I optically... Do. There's, there's... I do because optically they've gotten to the point by that almost every lens out there is so good. Now, <laughs> yeah. you know, but, but, you know, it's we're splitting hairs literally about sharpness. And <clears throat> remember at the apertures I shoot at typically F5, 6, F8, F11, even the quote unquote crappy lenses <laughs> are, are pretty, <laughs> pretty good uh, out, out in the periphery. Uh, but living in Seattle, doing a lot of outdoor activities, uh, probably the number one thing important that's important to me is weather sealing. So I really look out for that. I mean, I will upgrade lenses based just on that. Uh, but th that's a very personal decision. You know, So a lot of people uh, uh, don't really care about that. And, and there are ways you can go about protecting your equipment, even if it's not weather sealed. Uh, and I've had you know, non-weather sealed equipment that I've shot in the rain every so often that nothing has happened to, but it's just my own personal peace of mind <laughs> that I really look for that. Uh, as far as image stabilization, I know that's very important to a lot of people. For me, it's probably one of the least important things because I'm almost always shooting on a tripod. Uh, so, you know, even if I didn't have image stabilization, it, for me, it wouldn't make a difference. Interesting. So, and that's just the proof is in the pudding right there where everybody has different needs. And there's not a, a one size fits all answer that you we can give recommendations, we can kind of help people out in a certain circumstance they have. But overall, I think you have to kind of see what matters most to you. And most importantly, what do you shoot? If, it, yeah. if you're not getting something that fits what you shoot, then there's no such thing as the best lens. It's really what's the best lens for you and what's the best lens for what you're going to be using it for. Right. And, uh, and a reminder that don't all flock to Seattle. It's not nice in the summer. <laughs> Rain's constant. <laughs> oh, Mahesh, always good having you on, man. It's You keep it light. You keep it fun. It's like we don't even realize that we're being filled with information. You get it in there so so smoothly. So <laughs> Thanks for you. It's, uh, you know, it's, I, I, was, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and they're like, well, you know, when did you start shooting? Uh like, well, you know, I've actually never shot film in my life. So I started shooting when digital first came into being. I remember like picking up the first point and shoot Kodak. That was like a half a megapixel. <laughs> and, you know, had those memory cards that had like 512 meg capacities, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> that JPEG with the dynamic range of five or something. You, know? <laughs> you pull those images Photoshop, up now. Photoshop 0 0.8. It wasn't even oh, a full version. It was, it was beta Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even, they're like thumbnail size. And you're like, wait, did yeah, I have the right. settings wrong back then? You're like, no, I was maxed out. <laughs> you know, you know, what's a, what's a, what's a, what's a nice exercise is uh, they've got all these, uh, these AI based, computer systems or or programs that can upscale images so i took one of my old images and it was pretty good yeah. i was surprised at how good some of these ai uh, <laughs> ai stuff was of taking like these very tiny sub megapixel images and blowing up to like you know four no megapixels way. I'm, I'm gonna have to get you back on here to do it in upscaling uh oh yeah, it, upscaling. it's funny you should mention that because i recently published an article about if it really makes a difference, what I did was I took a 60 megapixel image that I took in Iceland and I downsized it to like 10 megapixels, right? And then I took that 10 megapixel image and upscaled it to the same 60 megapixels using like four different softwares and compared it. So so I'm going to spoil it for you guys in case you never have me on again. Uh, for prints, which is, which is very counterintuitive, for prints, it does not matter. Because people think the end all be all of comparison is making large prints and looking at it. That's going to really differentiate the high megapixel from the low megapixel. That's untrue because when you make prints, no matter how refined the image, how, how great the paper, when you want a dot hits that paper, it's going to bleed. It's going to spread. Mm. So any little bit of sharpness gain that you may have gained from, from the higher megapixel, it's going to be lost. I, I guarantee you. But what it really makes a difference is on the screen. Because we have these 5K monitors, 6K monitors, 8K monitors. We like to crop the crap out of our images and look at it 100%. Yeah, when you do that, it makes a huge difference on the megapixel size. But actually making prints, 
and 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 a, and at a at a normal viewing distance, I actually had ten people look at them, five photographers, and they were all over the place as far as what they thought was the the sixty megapixel native image versus a bunch of these programs that we used to upres. Wow, I'm shocked. I mean, it makes <laughs> sense when you explain it, but it's something that I honestly I've, I've thought about, but I never really dove into. So. Yeah, yeah, and so when you make that, and I, and I sort of delving and I really did a lot of research. When you're when you're making prints, every time it, it the ink is laid on a paper, that no matter how good the paper, it's going to spread a little bit, you know. So any 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 minor differences in sharpness is going to be lost because of that. Until they computerize ink. Yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> let me. It's not just F four lenses. You get a lot more information here than this F four lenses. <laughs> I was about to say, half the people are out there like, wait, what did I tune into? What is going on here? And the other half are like, wait, yeah, okay, I'm running with it. Well, look, Mahesh, always good to have you on, man. And to all of our viewers out there, thanks, thanks for guys. sticking with us through our, you know, we, we got to have these little moments. Sometimes we get derailed, but it's all about the information at the end of the day. Yeah, and I hope we got plenty sure. of that to you guys today. So huge thank you to Mahesh for joining us as always. And Sony for being a wonderful host on this entire series. And to all of our viewers out there, can't do it without you. We do it for all of you. But alas, another rendition of the BH virtual event space is in the books. Catch y'all next time. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, Mahesh.